Who is a person that everyone thought was crazy, but they ended up being right? Story 1. Alfred Wegener, who first proposed continental drift, what would ultimately become plate tectonics. Geologists of the day considered him an outsider and rejected his theory. Story 2. Christine Collins, famously portrayed by Angelina Jolie in the movie Changling. After her son was abducted, the police found him months later and reunited them. But Christine was adamant that it wasn't her son Walter and was an imposter. Even though she had evidence to prove it, she was temporarily committed by the officer in charge of the case. And even after the kid admitted he lied and wasn't Walter, it still took over a week to release Christine. Story 3. Some of the elderly patients with dementia in a home in my city kept complaining they weren't given food. Everyone thought they must have forgotten that they'd already eaten, as people with dementia sometimes do. Nope. Turns out some pieces of shit nursing staff didn't always give everyone their meals, amongst other abuse. Story 4. Ludwig Boltzmann. His equations and formulas explained the physical properties of matter. But as it went against the then-accepted laws of physics, he was ridiculed and ignored for years while fighting for atom theory to be accepted. He took his own life just three years before Ernest Rutherford discovered the nucleus of an atom, proving Boltzmann's theory. Story 5. Kotaku Wamura. He was the longtime mayor of the Japanese town of Fudai, 1940s to 1980s. While mayor, he learned that the town had been devastated in the past by tsunamis. He literally saw the bodies from one of the disasters and ordered the construction of an enormous seawall. While other towns in the area also had sea walls, this thing was considered insanely high overkill. The project was hideously expensive, and he was relentlessly mocked. He died in 1997. In 2011, a tsunami struck Japan, killing approximately 20,000 people. The sea wall worked as planned, protecting Fudai, and the town escaped almost untouched. Story 6, Gustav Kailbot. He was born to a wealthy Parisian family in 1848. His father owned a textile business that he later inherited. He was an artist in his own right, but became much more known as a supporter of the arts. Fearful he'd die young, he writes in his will that the French state accept his large art collection, today valued at several billion dollars, and hang art from several impressionist artists, who were friends of his, in a national museum upon his death. Kyle Bott dies young, 45, in 1894 as he predicted, and so his will attempts to be executed. The French government initially refuses the request. Pundits and critics, from art to politics, view the request as absurd and publicly say how repulsed they are by the collection itself. Several art professors from École des Beaux-Arts threaten to resign if the government enacts the will. In the end, Half of Kyle Bott's art collection gets hung in 1897 at the Musée de Luxembourg, and the public comes out in droves to visit the gallery because of all the press Kyle Bott's request had received after his death. People wanted to see this ugly art. The artists featured, their names were Monet, Renoir, Degas, Cezanne, Manet, Pissarro, and Sisley. It's very possible these artists would never have become the household names they are today had Kyle Bott not liked the ugly, unsellable art that a few of these friends of his made. Story 7. My grandma. She insisted people kept stealing her newspaper and specifically said it was someone in a white van. Grandma was always a little off, so we just thought she was paranoid and had a bad delivery person. Until one day my mom and I are driving past her house and a white van in front of us stopped, stole my grandma's newspaper, and drove off. Grandma wasn't crazy after all, at least not about that. Story 8. Barry James Marshall was one of the scientists who discovered that the bacteria H. pylori causes stomach ulcers. However, getting people to believe it was difficult. It was thought that lifestyle and excessive stomach acid were the main factor the lead to ulcers. So when he suggested that a bacterial infection could cause it, no one believed him. In response, he infected himself with H. pylori by drinking cultures, which in turn gave himself stomach ulcers, and then treated the infection. He and Robin Warren received a Nobel Prize for this discovery. Story 9. The lady who got burned from McDonald's coffee. If I recall, she was so injured she lost 20% of her body weight while hospitalized. McDonald's was later discovered to be intentionally selling nuclear hot coffee because you couldn't drink it quickly and thus ordered fewer refills. Story 10. Writer Ernest Hemingway was convinced the FBI had him under surveillance. His friends and family told him he was nutters, until some unsealed records a while back proved that he actually was being followed, had his phones bugged, etc. Story 11. 
Rose McGowan. She was talking crazy shit about people following her and ex-Mossad agents being involved. She was dismissed as insane. Turns out Weinstein had an army of spies. He had following victims to keep them quiet, including the exact people she had described. Story 12. Marshall McLuhan. His theories on how media usage changes how we think and interact with each other were prophetic. He predicted the internet and how a worldwide instant form of communication would create tribes of people centered around their own echo chambers. He also wrote about how using media changes how we think and process information. Considered a crazy pop culture media and literature speculator in the 60s, now his ideas have been pretty much confirmed by modern neuroscience and communication study. Sadly, he died before the internet happened. It would have been incredible to see his theories on social media. Story 13. Harlem J. Bretz was a geologist who in the 1920s proposed that the geologic features of the channeled scab lands of eastern and central Washington were the result of a massive flood during the last ice age at 15,000 years ago, when a glacial dam in northern Idaho catastrophically collapsed, releasing the waters of Lake Missoula. Lake Missoula is estimated to have contained a volume of water equivalent to Lakes Erie and Ontario combined, and the resulting flood through what is now eastern Washington and out through the Columbia Gorge released a water flow exceeding the combined flow of all other rivers on the planet. Bretz was soundly ridiculed when he proposed this scenario in the 1920s, but was eventually vindicated over the next 50 years and was eventually awarded the Geological Society of America's prestigious Penrose Medal in 1979 at the age of 96. By that time, as he put it, all his detractors were dead, so he had no one left to gloat over. Story 14. The many British postal workers fired and prosecuted for stealing. Many were lifelong employees. Some committed suicide. This went on for almost two decades. Spoiler. It was a surveillance software glitch that went ignored for years. They were all innocent. Edit. Surveillance software was hyperbole on my part. And incorrect. I honestly forgot exactly what the software's purpose was, only that it was buggy AF and incorrectly flagged employees or employee activity in a way that made it look like they were stealing. Story 15. Gary Webb the San Jose Mercury news reporter that uncovered the CIA link to crack cocaine into Los Angeles. The government used other newspapers to discredit him. A few years later, he was found in his home with two bullet holes in his head and the coroner ruled it a suicide. He was right. Story 16. I had an aunt, cousin, not really aunt, but everyone in Spanish families calls everyone tias, primas, so who even knows? Anyway, she was convinced her then 35-year-old husband was having an affair with her much younger 20-year-old cousin a summer she let the cousin stay during a visit to the States. It got to the point where her own family thought she was being crazy. They ended up getting separated, and she was thought of as the paranoid person in the family, and a lot of people sadly turned on her and stopped being in contact. The divorce happened shortly after. And guess who a year after the ex-husband ends up marrying? Yep. Story 17. Sister Kenny and her physical therapy for polio victims. The treatment at the time was to lock up the affected limbs in braces or casts, leaving the patient crippled for life. Her idea of using hot compresses and gently moving the limbs took a very long time to be accepted by the medical establishment as she was a woman and just a nurse. Story 18. I don't remember his name, but a man on one of the planes that crashed into the Twin Towers called police and told them that there were suspicious people on his plane. They didn't take him seriously. The people he saw turned out to be two of the four hijackers on the plane. Story 19, Glenda Cleveland. She tried to stop Jeffrey Dahmer, and instead, the police believed him over her. To this day, I believe that it was because she and Dahmer's victim, Conorak Synthesomphone, were POC and Dahmer was white. Story 20, Jackie Stewart. He was sick and tired of burying his friends due to racing accidents, so he started advocating for safety at the tracks, in the cars, and pushing for more qualified medical personnel. He once said, I'd be more popular if I would shut up and drive. Dead, but more popular. Stewart was a 3X world champion for the record. He also won on the hardest track ever built, the Nürburgring Nordschleife, by four minutes with a broken wrist. The man was as hard a racer as they come, and yet he was ridiculed for not wanting to see himself and others get injured or killed while racing. Many of the things Stewart pushed for then are requirements at nearly every racing event today. Story 21. 
Many, many years ago, a new stoplight was installed near my house at a fairly busy multi-lane intersection. The first time I went to this light, I was taking a left, waited in the left turn lane until I got a green arrow, and proceeded into the intersection, as did the person coming from my left who was going straight, and also had a green light. We almost crashed, but at the time I assumed they had run the light and I'm sure they assumed the same about me. On my way home, I sat in an adjacent parking lot and watched. And sure enough, the lights were timed completely wrong and giving conflicting drivers the right of way at the same time, and I saw three other near misses in about ten minutes. I called the police to report it, and they essentially laughed at me. The next day, two people died in a crash at that intersection, and they fixed the light by the end of the next night. I'm guessing they wish they'd taken a look when I told them about it. Story 22 Midwives had been washing their hands for years when delivering babies, but no one accepted that as standard practice because they were women, and what do they know? And even though handwashing was common with midwives, it's still attributed to a male doctor from the 1800s as the origin of the idea. Story 23 When I was a cop, there was this lady who called every week and said someone had been in her house. I mean, dozens of cops went out there, and she would say like her dresser drawer was open and she knew it had been closed when she left the house. Never any signs of forced entry, no prints. Nothing to say this was anything other than a crazy person. Until months later, one of her high school students was caught with a key to her house. Turns out this kid had been sneaking in and just moving shit slightly to fuck with her. Story 24. My first wife, who always said I had more mental health issues than just the one diagnosis at the time we were together. I put her through hell for years and she kept doing her best to help, support, and protect me from myself. She did this even before we were married. We are still good friends to this day. Story 25, Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys. One of the main themes in his lyrics is that the American right is planning a fascist takeover of America, not too dissimilar from what happened to Germany. This goes back to 1980. Most saw him as a kook or an alarmist, but it is now clear that he was absolutely correct. Story 26, Shuji Nakamura, inventor of the first commercially viable blue LED, which was the precursor to the white LED. Without white LEDs, you would not be reading this on your smartphone under the soft glow of high-efficiency LED light bulbs. The key component to the blue and white LED is gallium nitride, which had eluded engineers for decades and was widely dismissed as a dead end. Nikia, Nakamura's former employer, tried several times to kill his research and development after years with no results. Story 27. Bernie Sanders was the only person in the Senate who voted against going to war in Iraq. We all thought we were riding to war to end a terrible regime, and to a certain extent we were, but we were lied to about almost everything else, and Bernie was one of the few to see it. People mocked him for it for years, but more than 20 years later, history has vindicated him. Story 28, Mitt Romney in the 2012 debate with Obama and basically his entire campaign. All of his foreign policy calls came to fruition, and his criticism of the Republican Party was pretty spot on too. I'm not arguing he would have been a better president than Obama, but he was incredibly smart, and the media tore him to shreds for shit they didn't even understand. Story 29. This is a super niche thing, but it happened recently, and it's unbelievably hilarious. There is a Twitter progression. A few months ago, someone tweeted, There are Jews living under my apartment. I live at ground level, and I have no basement. It's like they are digging or something. He was mocked, accused of hearing voices called racist, the works. He posted again, I swear I keep hearing Yiddish under the floor of my NY apartment. I live at ground level and we have no basement. Again, most of the comments recommended that he get his head checked for hearing invisible Jews. Anyway, a Brooklyn synagogue was recently caught digging illegal tunnels. He tweeted, some of you owe me an apology. I swear I lost it over this. I could not stop laughing. You can't make it up. Story 30. Lisa Bonet. No, seriously. Hear me out. I remember when she quit the Cosby show back in the 80s and people thought she was crazy. First of all, to have a rumored beef with America's favorite dad? What was she thinking? Then, hooking up with some strange-looking musician named Romeo Blue? Career suicide, we all said. Looking back, she was right on multiple fronts and had excellent taste. Story 31. In the 1990s, Brooksley Bourne warned USA Congress that lack of regulation and oversight of exotic derivatives could have catastrophic consequences for the world economy. Every other regulator came out and bashed Born in front of Congress. Granted, Born didn't know how nor when, they were dead right on the consequences of poorly regulated banking and derivatives would derail the world economy, which has yet to really fully recover. 
Story 32. I was in class with a guy about 10 years ago, and he was talking about how his male cousin went to L.A. to meet P. Diddy about a record deal. He turned it down because he said to get the record deal, he would have had to sleep with P. Diddy. Everyone in class laughed at him and said, no way. Guess we were wrong. Story 33. Clay Tiffany. If you're from Westchester County, New York, you've likely heard of him. Clay had a local public access show, Dirge of the Charlatans, and was known for his rants and bright red afro. He claimed he was assaulted and targeted by a Briarcliff Manor police officer, Nicholas Tartaglione. Over the next few years, Clay uncovered even more cases of abuse of authority and violent assaults committed by Tartaglione. And Tartaglione beat him up multiple times after, including one time where his ribs were broken and his orbital bone. Well, Clay wasn't perfect, and I grew up watching him on TV and laughing at his antics. Years later, Nicholas Tartaglione was arrested for killing four people and was a known drug dealer. Tartaglione was also Jeffrey Epstein's cellmate, and he's currently detained in a federal penitentiary. Clay was right all along, and no one believed him because they thought he was nuts. Story 34. Geologist Engineer David Bernays. In 1970, the town of Yungay, Peru, vanished under a sea of mud and rock, a catastrophe foreseen by a man whose warnings went unheeded. David Bernays, an engineer with keen insight into the geological instabilities of the Andes, Bernays predicted that the region was at severe risk of a landslide if an earthquake were to strike. Despite presenting compelling evidence alongside geologist Charles Sawyer, their urgent cautions were dismissed by local authorities and the populace. Bernays and Sawyer had conducted extensive studies on the glacier perched atop Mount Huascarán. Their research concluded that the glacier was precariously unstable and an earthquake could trigger a landslide of unimaginable proportions, posing a direct threat to the towns nestled below, including Yungay. They envisioned a scenario where thousands of lives could be lost in mere moments, urging for evacuation plans and preventive measures. Tragically, their fears became reality on May 31, 1970 when a 7.9 magnitude earthquake rocked the region. The quake dislodged millions of cubic meters of ice, mud, and rock from Mount Huascaran's north peak, unleashing an avalanche that barreled down at speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour. The town of Yungay was obliterated under the onslaught, with the death toll in the region estimated to be around 20,000 people. This event marked one of the deadliest natural disasters in the history of Peru, and served as a somber lesson on the importance of heeding scientific warnings. David Bernays's foresight into the disaster at Yungay underscores the vital need for respecting and acting upon geological assessments to mitigate the impact of natural catastrophes. His story is a testament to the critical importance of science in disaster preparedness and the tragic consequences of ignoring expert advice.